This is Derek Braggs from Meticulous Word Ministries. Isaiah 28 and 10 says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now, let me say this. When reading the Bible, it is important to understand the who, what, when, where, and why. You need to know the answer to these questions. To whom does the scriptures refer? Does it pertain to a specific people? Is it for everyone? Does it pertain to us today? Or is it an example from which we are to learn? What is the message? Is it literal? Is it figurative? Is it an allegory? What is the spiritual revelation? That's key. Does it refer to the time when it was written or is it still relevant today? When did it happen or when will it take place? Is it geographically specific? How does it apply to us today? Is a particular subject still relevant today? Why was it written? What is the message? For whom is it written? Is this an example or is it a standard? Who is it concerning? Is the scripture consistent with another scripture? Is this before or after Christ? Because Christ uh, brought in a change. So you had things that were in place before Christ came. And then when Christ came, there was a transition to the things that would be in place after Christ was resurrected. And when you answer these questions, it allows for the maximum understanding and it will eliminate the possibility of private interpretation. Okay. All right. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to break all of these things down so that you can get the proper understanding of Isaiah 28 and 10, because I spoke with somebody who said Isaiah 28 and 10 was a punishment and therefore it is not a blueprint for you to study the Bible. That everything is in one place. So when you read that chapter, every piece of information should be given in that um, chapter where I'm going to tell you that that is not true. Okay, so let's get into the, 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 the teaching. First of all, the book of Isaiah is written by the prophet Isaiah, who lived at the end of the 8th century B.C., before Christ. Approximately 60 years, he lasted uh, four kings, okay? We find this in, in, in Isaiah 1. Um, now, the book of Isaiah can be divided into three sections, three major sections, three categories, and that will be of Chapters 1 through 39 will be Judah being threatened by Assyria. And then from 40 to 55 will be Judah uh, in exile in Babylon. And then chapter 56 through 66 is going to be Judah back in the land. Okay, so when you read in the book of Isaiah, you can break it down into those three categories. Okay, now before we understand who uh, Isaiah is addressing in chapter 28, let me give you the background leading up to this point. And we need to cover the split of the, the kingdom, the split of, of Israel into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Okay, so 1 Kings 12 and 19 says, So Israel rebelled against the house of David until this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation. And made him king over all of Israel and was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. OK, but actually, this represents the kingdom of Judah right here. OK, and Jeroboam was come to Jerusalem. He assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. See, so it's, a, it's the kingdom and one hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against the house of Israel. To bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, speak unto Rehoboam and the son of the son of Solomon, king of Judah, unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, see, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus said the Lord, ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Okay, return every man into his house. For this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the um they hearken therefore to the word of the Lord and return to deport according to the word of the Lord. So we're seeing that the division is in place. But Israel, the, the Judah, the southern kingdom, was 
instructed not to fight against Israel. So when, when the split happens, you're going to have the house of Israel is going to be the northern kingdom. And then Judah is going to be the southern kingdom. Okay. But also we're going to find out that uh, Israel, the northern kingdom had other names that uh, they were referred to by. Okay, and we're going to, I'll cover that. So I don't need to tell you now, but I'm just throwing it out there. So listen to this, Judah and Benjamin are in the South. We see that in the scripture, Zechariah 2 and 12 says, and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion of the Holy Land, Judah, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Okay, so what we understand by this is when whenever you see Jews, but well not whenever you see Jews, but to a certain point, when, when Jesus said, um, that um, salvation is of the Jews, he's talking about the southern kingdom of Judah, okay? Now you're gonna get to a point where all of Israel is gonna be referred to as uh, Jews, but you just need to understand, it depends on when you read, and I don't have time to break all of that down now, I'm just giving you a basic uh, backdrop, okay? Now having said that, <clears throat> who is Isaiah 28 addressed to, okay? First, it's going to be addressed to Ephraim, the northern kingdom. Okay. All right. So after the split, again, we just broke down the split. Hosea and Isaiah refer to the northern kingdom as Ephraim. So when you whenever you're reading Hosea's writing and Isaiah uh, writing, when they say Ephraim, they actually mean the northern kingdom of, of, of Israel. I'll give you an example, Hosea 4 and 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. This is referring to that northern kingdom. Okay? Because Hosea 5 and 3. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hid from thee. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defiled. So just remember that um that basically Hosea and Isaiah was the ones that referred to Ephraim, um, referred to Israel as Ephraim. In Isaiah 28, from the beginning to verse 7, uh, verse 6, Isaiah is addressing the northern kingdom. Okay? All right? But then at verse 7, he begins to address Judah, the priests of Judah, the leaders of Judah. Okay, and the reason why I'm not going to read one through six is because we I'm focusing on Isaiah 28 and 10. Okay, so watch this Isaiah 28 and 7 says, But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priests and the prophet have erred through strong drink, they are swallowed up of wine, they are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Notice it says the priests and the prophets, okay, are erring in their judgment, their vision. Why are they being addressed? It's because of that error, okay? Because when we see priests here, okay, let, let's, let's go here. Priests here, uh, in Israel, the priests are all going to be from Levi. Joshua 13, 33, but unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. So when you get to understanding the tithe and how the land was broken down, Levi never received any land because Levi's job was to take care of the house of God, to feed the people. So in return or exchange for them um, feeding the people, okay, in exchange for them feeding the people, then they receive the tithes of the land, okay? All right, so the, the priests only come from the tribe of Levi. Now, somebody might say, no, that's not true because uh, the northern kingdom had priests, okay? So watch this. I don't want you to confuse it with the northern kingdom's attempt. Okay, 2 Kings 17 and 32 says, So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. Okay, they feared the Lord and served their own gods. 
after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. So watch this. What this is saying is what the northern kingdom did is since they didn't have the Levites, they made whoever they wanted to be priests. Now, al already you can understand that that would be uh, disobedience to God. OK, so they made their own priests and they served their own gods. So this is why the northern kingdom was always in um, idolatry. And God pretty much was just sending warnings to them. Hey, you better get it together. Better get it together. But Judah, even though the kingdom of Judah was um, disobedient to God, at least they still worshiped in the place where God told them to worship. Where did God tell them to worship? The permanent place was Jerusalem. Okay. Remember, this is why Jesus told the woman, uh, the Samaritan woman, you say that in Jerusalem is where we should worship. She said, but my father's worship in these mountains. Okay. Because God said worship in Jerusalem. And this is where the Southern kingdom worshiped. The Northern kingdom did not worship in Jerusalem. They created their, their own places to worship. Uh, this is how you end up with synagogues and stuff like that. Okay. Now, where are the priests located? Right. In second Chronicles 11 and 14, it says for the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. OK, so it's telling you here in Second Chronicles that the Levites went and joined the southern kingdom. Now, after all, you must understand, too, that the Levites go with the Ark of the Covenant. OK, they have to work in the house of the Lord, which is at this point in Jerusalem. OK, let's understand that. All right. Um, which is in Jerusalem. OK. Let's get, let's go back into Isaiah 28. Verse eight says, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Okay. Whom shall teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from breast. So they're saying that they're saying that this is, you know, like, who does this guy think he is? You know, what he's teaching is for babies. OK, now understand this again. Let me let me let me I'm, I'm hammering. I'm giving you more than enough information to understand this message. Deuteronomy 10 and 8 says at the time of the at the time at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him and to bless his name unto this day. So Levites. The Levites job was to teach the people, was to feed the people. OK, so this is clearly addressing those that were supposed to be feeding the people because then that their judgment and their vision and stuff is, is cloudy. OK, so watch this for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line here a little and there a little. OK, so even though they're saying that they're saying that. Why is he trying to teach us letter by letter, line by line, and lesson by lesson? Who does he think he is to teach us letter by letter, line by line, lesson by lesson? Like we are rookies, like we're some babies to this. We know what the word of God said. That's what they're saying. Okay. But what you will understand about, about um, the spiritual aspect of this is, Immature people, those that are wicked, always try to find a reason not to be obedient. So they're rejecting Isaiah at this point, saying, who does he think he is? We already know. You can't tell us. After all, we're the priests. We're the ones who teach the, the people what thus saith the Lord. We take care of the house of God. Verse 11 says, for with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? Is he saying that, hey. I'm going to use another nation, foreign language, to teach you, okay? Now, this was prophesied that God would make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness. Zechariah 12, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of, of trembling unto all the people round about, 
and they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. You see, against Judah and Jerusalem, southern kingdom. This is a, a prophecy that was already prophesied against Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, to, against Judah. Okay, to whom he said, we're at verse 12 now, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So this is why the Lord is teaching you a uh, lesson by lesson. Okay, this is why the Lord is teaching you lesson by lesson. But the word of God, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken. Okay, so watch this. Let's pause right here because they're saying that, okay, well, this is a punishment. This is clearly a punishment that God is using this, this technique to punish them. And when we say broken here, it's, it's figurative of men stumbling, okay? Now, this is a principle of righteousness. Understand this. This is a principle of righteousness. The purpose of the laws of God are always so that we may be guilty before God. I need you to understand that. The purpose of the laws of God, these principles, are that we may be guilty before God. Okay? Romans 3 and 19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law said, it said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. That's the purpose of the law, so that you will know that you are not righteous, that you are not perfect, and that according to God, you're nothing. You are guilty according to the word of God. Verse 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Also, I had not known what sin was, but for the law. That's what taught me that I was in sin. Okay. I'll read Galatians 2 and 16 says, knowing that man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So everybody that was under the law was not justified. Okay, justification comes by faith. Okay, all right. Justification comes by faith. Now, I need to, let me throw something into this, this, this teaching right now. Second Timothy 3 and 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture. Okay? All scripture. Now, here's what you need to understand. Since it's saying that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, when you look at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so on, all of these different books that are written by all of these different authors, since the source of this is the inspiration of God, all of these authors and books are one book. One book, one message. Everything is about Christ. All of this leads you to Christ. Remember before Christ, everything is going to lead you to Christ. And then after Christ was resurrected, everything that happens after that is the result of Christ. So before Christ, all, everything is going to lead you to Christ and uh, everything after he was resurrected leads back to Christ. OK, understand that. So when you understand line upon line upon line, precept upon precept here, a little and there, a little, it's all one message. But what we have to understand is that uh, the Bible has an intricate message system. What does that mean? It means that the message is hidden in different places. It's not in one spot. 
So it is impossible for you to read, you to say that, okay, I want to read about, I'm going to study the chapter on love. It doesn't exist. I'm going to study the chapter on salvation. It doesn't exist. It's throughout the Bible. So this is why the Bible can't, see when people say that parts of the Bible is, the Bible is incomplete, uh, parts of the Bible has been stolen. So how do you know what you're reading? Because of that intricate message system, because of that design. So if the message is in different places, you can take a chapter out the Bible and, and still get the message. You can take a book out the Bible and still get the message because it's not included in, in one spot. So this is why it's lesson by lessons here and there. You see? So this is why God was telling them that, hey, I'm going to bring you lesson by lesson here a little and there a little. Why? Because you think you know, and now your vision is cloudy. You're erring in scripture, in vision, and judgment. So I got to bring you back down to the basis. And my basis, when I teach you letter by letter, line by line, lesson by lesson, I'm going to make sure that your foundation is uh, sturdy, is concrete. Because I got to get rid of everything that you're part of now because you, 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 your, your walk is contaminated. So we got to go back to the basis. Letter by letter, line by line, here a little, there a little. Got to go back to the basis so that you'll be able to judge properly. Okay? All right? So God warned when we get back to, 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 um, to um, Isaiah 28. After they are taught letter by letter, line by line, uh, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, they still have to face the consequences of disobedience. Please understand that. Because remember, it is the law of God that makes us guilty. And see, Judah at this time and Israel are guilty, but the, the, the priests, the leaders of Israel, vision is cloudy. They done, they done heard so much of the, the, the people around them that now it's it's a blurred line between what thus saith the Lord and what the, the pagans are, are practicing, right? So this is why God got to bring them back to the basis, letter by letter, okay? Now, here's the thing. Did Judah ever end up in exile? Yes, we know that they ended up in exile. That's why I gave you the breakdown in the book. Chapters 40 through 55 is going to be Israel in exile, See, and God warned them ahead of time that he would use the Assyrians to execute judgment on Judah for their idolatry. So here God is using the enemy because of Israel's wickedness. Isaiah 10, beginning at verse 5, it says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hands is mine indignation, indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation. Who's that hypocritical nation? Israel. And against the people of my wrath, will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So he's saying that this is my enemy, but I'm going to use my enemy against this hypocritical nation. And they're going to become your spoil. Howbeit he mean it not so, neither do it his heart think so, but it is in the heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. And when we drop down to verse 7, it says, Shall I do as I have done unto Samaria and her idols? So do to Jerusalem and her idols. So this is letting you know that, hey, listen, Israel, the, the northern kingdom has already been, been, been chastised. She's already fallen. She's already in captivity, already been defeated. Now I got to do the same thing with Jerusalem. Now, as we read verse 14, getting back into Isaiah 28, uh, Isaiah 28, it is not a shift in the targeted audience, but it is a continuation addressing Judah. 
Verse 14 starts off by saying, wherefore? See? So, as I was saying, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. See, it's talking about the, the rulers in Jerusalem. It is clear. Okay? So, it's getting, so I'm continuing talking to them that erred in vision and, and stumble in judgment. Verse 15, but ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us for we have made lies of uh, lies, our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. Behold, I lay in Zion, Jerusalem, for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And we're going to understand that, that that cornerstone is going to be Christ. Okay. All right. Now, here is the most important part of the passage. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This is the principle of how you study the Bible. You study the similar topics which are scattered throughout the scripture instead of studying chapters by chapter, which may cover different topics. Now, let me help you understand. I'm going to say that again. You do not study the Bible just reading the entire, I'm going to read the, the entire book of, of Genesis. Yeah, it's okay for you to read that, but check this out. There are some things that you're not going to get the revelation just reading in, in Genesis. Because there are some things that are in Genesis, the revelation is in the book of Revelation. A lot of things are written in Genesis. You get the connection in Revelation. When you're talking about the, the serpent, you don't understand who the serpent is until you get to Revelation. Because Revelation is going to make it, and you know what? I'll go over that. I'll cover that. Let me, let me, let me get back here. When you, when you, let's, let me, let me explain this to you because I hear people say, I start at the beginning of the chapter. Okay. Well, here's what we understand about the chapter division. Stephen Langton. Okay. Um, doing, uh, uh, he was the, the, the archbishop of Canterbury. OK, um, he is accredited with dividing the Bible into chapters. OK. All right. This was around the uh, 11, 1150 to 1228, somewhere in that 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 time is when he divided the Bible into chapters. OK. Now, as for the verses, the verses did not come until another 300 years by uh, Santi uh, Pagnini. Sag, uh, Santi Pagnini. This was in 1555. He came up with the verses. Okay? All right? So therefore, the first English Bible to have chapters and verses would be the Geneva Bible in 1560. Okay? Now, we know that... Um, we know that King James 1611 and 1629 became the version, became the standard English Bible. Okay. But the Geneva Bible had chapters and verses was the first uh, Bible to have chapter and verses. Okay. So that tells you that this is a fairly new thing. They wasn't writing. So these, these, these prophets, uh, they were not writing. Um, these prophets, these kings, these judges were not writing chapters at a time. They was writing the entire thing. Okay. But we came along later in life and divided it up uh, and broke it down into chapters and, and verses. So it will be easier for us to refer to. Now, let me say this. What is easier for us to refer to also cause us to not read the entire things. You see, so now we just go to one scripture and now you have um, you have doctrines that are based on one scripture. OK, now let me give you an example of of 
how a chapter can begin in the wrong place. John chapter three is considered to be uh, the when Jesus met Nicodemus. OK, but the story actually begins in John two and twenty three. OK, and, and matter of fact, let me let me pull this up and, and read it for you instead of just uh, just saying that John three and one says it's titled Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Okay, so it seems like, okay, this is the beginning of Nicodemus and Jesus. But actually, this begins in John chapter 2. We go back to verse uh, verse 23. Okay, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name. And when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man. So this is what's happening. OK, this is where it begins. And Nicodemus is coming to him as a result of what's happening here. OK, I hope that 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 that's that's clear for you to understand. But. I'm going to continue, okay? Because I, I, I and I, and I want to go back to this again. I want to, I want to reiterate this again. In in Second Timothy three, instead of reading this verse sixteen, let me back up, okay? Verse thirteen says, "But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them." And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So it's telling you that the word of God is going to be the standard that everybody has to be held to. OK, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Everybody has an opinion. But when it comes down to God, your opinion is irrelevant. Your opinion is not welcomed. What you need to do is understand the scripture. And now your, your, your opinion has to be based on or the facts or the truth is based from the scripture. Okay. Now, watch this. I'm going to use Genesis chapter three to show you because now the entire time that I've been on Isaiah 28 and 10, we've been going to different scriptures, different books to show you what is taking place here a little, there a little, but let's, let's, I'm, I'm going to show you, let's use, uh, let's get a basic understanding of the enemy. Okay. Now, why, why are we going to talk about the enemy? Because it is our enemy. It is God's enemy. God said we are in a spiritual battle. So anytime you are in a spiritual battle, you need to know who you're fighting. You need to know who your enemy is or you will be destroyed. Now watch this. Genesis chapter three, verse one, the introduction of the serpent. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, had God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the serpent is saying, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God do it know that in the day uh, ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil evil okay so you have the introduction of this serpent i well, we don't know who it is we just know that this serpent is apparently against god and trying to manipulate this woman okay when we drop down to in genesis 14 it says and the lord god said unto the serpent because now he's handing out punishment because of sin because at this point adam and eve have eaten of the tree that they were instructed not to eat from 
And God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Hmm? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay? So basically what is happening in this moment is that God is declaring war on this serpent. But we do not know who the serpent is. And also we understand that that serpent has seed. But we do not know who the serpent is. So we go to Revelation 12 and 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Dragon. Okay. But we have no idea that this battle is spiritual. Now I'm going to connect it. Just follow me. We need Ephesians 6, which says, put on the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Hmm. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay. So we're seeing, now we saw, we saw the serpent. We saw the dragon. We're seeing the devil. But we do not know the identity of the serpent as Satan until we get to Revelation 12 and 9. And the great dragon, remember? And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So now in Revelation 12, we get all of those names which deceiveth the whole world. And it says that he deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And we understand that he has angels. So he has angels and he has seed. Now, in order, now this says that he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now you may say, yeah, but in the garden it said the serpent. Hmm? Right? But here it says the serpent. You may say, but uh, that's not enough. Well, let's go to Ezekiel 28 because we need to find out who was in the garden. Okay, watch this. Ezekiel 28, son of man, take up lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, uh, the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Hmm. Thou has been in eating the garden of God. And every precious stone was not covered. The sword, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So let's talk about this, this created being. But now it goes on to say, thou art the anointed cherub that covered. What is a cherub? An angel. So now we're understanding that this angel was in the garden of Eden. And I have, thou art the anointed chair that covered, and I have set thee so, thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Hmm. But the multitude of thy merchandise, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So we know that when we look at the Garden of Eden, it was Adam, it was Eve, it was the serpent. Those were the only three that were in the garden. So now we understand that serpent was Satan. But now we go to Isaiah 14 and we're going to find something else out about the serpent. Isaiah 14, 12 says, how art thou fallen from heaven? Remember, that's what was said in Revelation. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut, cut down to the ground, which did its weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So now we're seeing that this character named Lucifer sinned because iniquity was found in him and he wanted a throne higher than God's throne. But what we're understanding that this Lucifer is going to be the created name of Satan. So when he was created perfect, the sum of wisdom and beauty, his name was Lucifer. But when iniquity was found in him and he was kicked out of the presence of God, out of the holy mountain of God, his name became Satan, the serpent, the dragon, the devil. You see? You understand this? In John 10, we find out the purpose of Satan. The thief, now he's referred to as a thief. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that ye might have life, and that ye might have it more abundantly. So what we're seeing is in this war, in Genesis 14, 3, 14, and 15, there's a separation when God declares war on Satan and his seed. The Son of God is Christ. So this is the introduction of Christ, right? As referred to as the seed of the woman. Because thou hast done this, thou cursed above all cattle, and every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shall thou go, and thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. What is it? Her seed shall bruise thy head, Satan, and thou shall bruise his heel. So clearly, the seed of the woman will be victorious. And this will be the theme of the entire Bible from this point. It's going to be about that seed of the woman who will become known as Christ. Okay? So we see that the way the enemy attacks and what he came for to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? The other thing is when we go back to Genesis 1, we saw that he only wants to say that God is a liar. Because the first thing that he said is when he showed up talking to Eve is, had God said ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden, of every tree of the garden. Didn't God tell you that you're gonna, you can eat of every tree of the garden? That's what he said. And she said, no, he's, he said of every tree except the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, if we eat of it, we're going to die. And he said, ye shall not surely die. So he said, God lying. First he's saying that he's trying to create that doubt. Did God say that? He didn't say that. Ain't not going to happen to you. You see? Now, we identify how Satan attacks in, in, in Genesis 1. How does he attack? Watch this. Number one is the lust of the flesh. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, you see, that created that, that, that lust of the flesh. She saw it with her eyes. Now that's going to create a desire for it. So you got the lust of the flesh, and then you're going to have the lust of the eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes. When she looked at it, it was pleasant to the eyes. All of this is creating a desire. And then the third way is, so you have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and then the pride of life. She wanted to be like God. When she saw it was a treat, to, a fruit to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband. And he did eat. When she saw it was a, a fruit to make one wise. So she wanted to be like God. Because, see, that's what he told her. You're going to be as gods. You see that? Then, we already understand that there is going to be a rival between the two seeds. Because it said between thy seed, the seed of the woman, and your seed. Between thy seed and her seed. Rival. Okay? And when we get to Revelation 13, we find out that they are, that seed actually includes two with Satan makes three. Revelation 13, um, well, actually, if you read Revelation 13, 16, and 17, it'll, it'll make this clear. But in Revelation 13, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon uh, his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power, and his seat and great authority. So the dragon, the devil, gave this beast power, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave them the power, 
which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? Verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. You see? So what did we have to do? What did, what, what did, let's, let's, let's recap what we just did. We started off in Genesis chapter 3. But in order to, and we had this character introduced as the serpent. And all we know when we're reading, um, when we're reading chapter 3, it seems like it's actually talking about, it could be talking about a actual snake until there's a shift. Because remember, it says, it starts off, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So it's talking about an actual serpent and, and causing it, calling him a beast of the field. But this serpent, what is unusual is, the serpent has a voice, and he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Right? But when we got when we get down to verse 14, and God begins to hand out punishment, because let's back up to 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. The serpent tricked me. See? The, the snake tricked me into eating this, and I did eat. So God said, as a result, God said, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, watch this, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. So this, this snake is being punished above all cattle, which he was, and above every beast of the field. This animal is being punished, and upon thy belly shall thou go, and thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life. Hmm, this is actual snake and i but there's a shift when we get to 15 and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel now there's a shift from the physical serpent to the spiritual serpent and see what we understand is the physical serpent is being punished for yielding his members to sin. So the, the spiritual serpent, Satan, used the physical serpent's member to deceive Eve. And as a result of that, that physical serpent is punished. But also, in the punishment of that physical serpent was that he should be on his belly. Right? And the punishment of the spiritual serpent was that the seed of the woman, there's going to be separation between him and the woman, which is Israel, and between her seed, which is Christ, and his seed. And her seed, the seed of the woman, Christ, is going to bruise the head of Satan. And Satan is going to bruise his heel. Okay, so we went through Genesis, Revelation, Isaiah, all of these different places to understand what is going on in Genesis chapter three. Because once again, letter by letter, line by line, lesson by lesson. So whenever you're studying the Bible, you need to find out the connected lessons. So when we're studying this lesson of Satan, you need to find out every place in the Bible where Satan is mentioned. That is how you, you find out who he is. And remember, it was in bits and pieces that we found out who Satan was. His name was in one place. His, his another name was in another place. His tactics are in another place. You see? So this is why you study lesson by lesson, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, lesson by lesson. Because remember that inter, that integrated, um, integrated, um, um, a message system, which is designed to hide the message in different places. So therefore, again, you can, you can understand that any part of the Bible can be taken out, removed, 
and you will still get the message because God is smarter than we are. We can't think on the level of God. So God, knowing the, the heart of man, knew that man would try to say that, hey, or talk, knew that man or knew that the enemy would try to get rid of the message. So he put the message in different places, gave the message to everybody that, that was writing, that was speaking on behalf of God. So therefore, all scripture is, is given by inspiration of God. So that's why it's here a little there a little and it is a punishment because this these are going to be the guidelines that god will judge you according to okay remember the law made everybody guilty and since everybody is guilty now you use the law to say that okay live according to this this is how you should live okay so I hope that this has been enlightening and um, until next time, God bless you and keep you.